The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann R. Wies. Chapter 4, Part 1. Next morning all were early awake, and the children sprang about the tree like young monkeys. "'What shall we begin to do, father?' they cried. "'What do you want us to do to-day?' "'Rest, my boys,' I replied. "'Rest.' "'Rest?' repeated they. "'Why should we rest?' Six days shalt thou labour, and do all that thou hast to do, but on the seventh thou shalt do no manner of work. This is the seventh day, I replied. On it, therefore, let us rest. What, is it really Sunday? asked Jack. How jolly! Oh, I won't do any work, but I'll take a bow and arrow and shoot, and we'll climb about the tree and have fun all day. That is not resting, said I. "'That is not the way you are accustomed to spend the Lord's day.' "'No, but then we can't go to church here, and there is nothing else to do.' "'We can worship here as well as at home,' said I. "'But there is no church, no clergyman, and no organ,' said Franz. "'The leafy shade of this great tree is far more beautiful than any church,' I said. "'There we will worship our Creator. Come, boys, down with you.' turn our dining-hall into a breakfast-room. The children, one by one, slipped down the ladder. "'My dear Elizabeth,' said I, "'this morning we will devote to the service of the Lord, and by means of a parable I will endeavour to give the children some serious thoughts, but without books, or the possibility of any of the usual Sunday occupations, we cannot keep them quiet the whole day. Afterward, therefore, I shall allow them to pursue any innocent recreation they choose, and in the cool of the evening we will take a walk. My wife entirely agreed with my proposal, and having breakfasted, the family assembled round me, as we sat in the pleasant shade on the fresh, soft green grass. After singing some hymns and offering heartfelt prayers to the Almighty Giver of all good, I told the children I would relate to them a parable, instead of preaching a sermon. Oh! "'That would be delightful. I like the parables in the Bible better than anything,' said Franz. "'When can we hear you read out of the Bible again, father?' "'Ah, my little boy, your words reproach me,' returned I. "'While eagerly striving to procure from the ship what would feed our bodies, and provide for their comfort, I blush to think that I have neglected the bread of life, the word of God. I shall search for a Bible on my next return to the wreck.' Although our own books were nearly all destroyed, I am pretty sure to find one. At these words my wife arose, and, fetching her magic bag, she drew from it a copy of the Holy Scriptures, which I thankfully received from her hand, and, after reading aloud from its sacred pages, I spoke as follows. A great king, ruling in power and splendor over a vast realm of light and love, possessed within its boundaries a desolate and unfruitful island. This spot he made the object of his special care, and lavishing on it all the varied resources of his might and goodness, it bloomed in beauty, and became the happy residence of a band of colonists, who were charged not only with the cultivation and improvement of the soil, but each, individually, was bound to cherish in his soul the spirit of love and true allegiance to his sovereign. While this faithful union was maintained, the colony flourished, and the noblest virtues exalted and rendered happy the existence of every member of the race. That a discontented and rebellious spirit should ever have infected these fortunate subjects of so loving a master seems incredible, yet so it was. Disobedience and pride brought misery and punishment, the fair prospects of the colony were blighted, the labours of the colonists were unblessed, and total separation from the parent kingdom seemed inevitable. A message of pardon— of free forgiveness, was nevertheless accorded to these rebels, and to all who, humbly accepting it, moulded their future lives to the will of the great king, now revealed in a character even more gracious than before, was held out the promise of removal at last from among the ruins caused by the great rebellion, to the glory and undimmed splendour of the realm of light and blessedness. Having interested the children, I then, leaving allegory, pressed simply and earnestly home to each young heart the truths I sought to teach, and, with a short prayer for a blessing on my words, brought the service to a close. After a thoughtful pause we separated, 
and each employed himself as he felt disposed. I took some arrows, and endeavoured to point them with porcupine quills. Franz came to beg me to make a little bow and arrow for him to shoot with, while Fritz asked my advice about the tiger-cat skin and the cases he was to contrive from it. Jack assisted with the arrow-making, and inserting a sharp spine at one end of each reed, made it fast with pack-thread, and began to wish for glue to ensure its remaining firm. "'Oh, Jack, Mamma's soup is as sticky as anything,' cried Franz. "'Shall I run and ask for a cake of it?' "'No, no, little goose. Better look for some real glue in the tool-box.' "'There he will find glue, to be sure,' said I, "'and the soup would scarcely have answered your purpose. But, Jack, my boy, I do not like to hear you ridicule your little brother's ideas. Some of the most valuable discoveries have been the result of thoughts which originally appeared no wiser than his. While thus directing and assisting my sons, we were surprised by hearing a shot just over our heads— at the same moment two small birds fell dead at our feet, and looking up we beheld Ernest among the branches, as, bending his face joyfully toward us, he cried, "'Well hit! well hit! a good shot, wasn't it?' Then, slipping down the ladder and picking up the birds, he brought them to me. One was a kind of thrush, the other a small dove called the ortolan, and esteemed a very great delicacy on account of its exquisite flavour. As the figs on which these birds came to feed were only just beginning to ripen, it was probable that they would soon flock in numbers to our trees, and, by waiting until we could procure them in large quantities, we might provide ourselves with valuable food for the rainy season, by placing them, when half-cooked, in cases with melted lard or butter poured over them. By this time Jack had pointed a good supply of arrows, and industriously practised archery. I finished the bow and arrows for Franz, and expected to be left in peace, but the young man next demanded a quiver, and I had to invent that also, to complete his equipment. It was easily done by stripping a piece of bark from a small tree, fitting a flat side and a bottom to it, and then a string. Attaching it to his shoulders, the youthful hunter filled it with arrows and went off, looking, as his mother said, like an innocent little cupid bent on conquest." Not long after this we were summoned to dinner, and all right willingly obeyed the call. During the meal I interested the boys very much by proposing to decide on suitable names for the different spots we had visited on this coast. For, said I, it will become more and more troublesome to explain what we mean unless we do so. Besides which, we shall feel much more at home if we can talk as people do in inhabited countries, instead of saying, for instance, the little island at the mouth of our bay where we found the dead shark, the large stream near our tent across which we made the bridge, that wood where we found coconuts and caught the monkey, and so on. Let us begin by naming the bay in which we landed. What shall we call it? Oyster Bay, said Fritz. No, no, Lobster Bay, cried Jack, in memory of the old fellow who took a fancy to my leg. I think, observed his mother, that, in token of gratitude for our escape, we should call it Safety Bay. This name met with general approbation, and was forthwith fixed upon. Other names were quickly chosen. Our first place of abode we called Tentholm, the islet in the bay, Shark's Island, and the reedy swamp, Flamingo Marsh. It was some time before the serious question of a name for our leafy castle could be decided, but finally it was entitled Falconhurst, and we then rapidly named the remaining points. Prospect Hill, the eminence we first ascended, Cape Disappointment, from whose rocky heights we had strained our eyes in vain search for our ship's company, and Jekyll River, as a name for the large stream at our landing-place, concluded our geographical nomenclature. In the afternoon the boys went on with their various employments. Fritz finished his cases, and Jack asked my assistance in carrying out his plan of making a cuirass for Turk out of the porcupine skin. After thoroughly cleansing the inside, we cut and fitted it round the body of the patient dog. Then, when strings were sewn on, and it became tolerably dry, he was armed with this ingenious coat of mail, and a most singular figure he cut. 
Juno strongly objected to his friendly approaches, and got out of his way as fast as she could, and it was clear that he would easily put to flight the fiercest animal he might encounter, while protected by armour at once defensive and offensive. I determined to make also a helmet for Jack out of the remainder of the skin, which to his infinite delight I speedily did. Amid these interesting occupations the evening drew on, and after a pleasant walk among the sweet glades near our abode, we closed our Sabbath day with prayer and a glad hymn of praise, retiring to rest with peaceful hearts. Next morning I proposed an expedition to Tentholm, saying I wished to make my way thither by a different route. We left the tree well armed, I and my three elder sons each carrying a gun and game-bag, while little Franz was equipped with his bow and quiver full of arrows. A most curious party we formed, Fritz adorned with his belt of margay skin, and Jack with his extraordinary head-dress looked like a couple of young savages. Their mother and I walked together, she of the whole party being the only one unarmed, carried a jar in which to get butter from Tentholm. We were preceded by the dogs, Turk armed most effectively with his cuirass of porcupine skin, and Juno keeping at a respectful distance from so formidable a companion. Master Knips fully intended to mount his charger as usual, but when he saw him arrayed apparently in a new skin, he approached him carefully, and, touching him with one paw, discovered that such a hide would make anything but an agreeable seat. The grimace he made was most comical, and chattering vociferously he bounded toward Juno, skipped on her back, seated himself, and soon appeared perfectly reconciled to the change of steed. The flamingo saw us starting, and, having been much petted during the last day or two, considered himself entitled to accompany us. For some time he kept beside the children, following first one and then another as they explored the wood on either side. Their irregular course, however, at length disgusted him, and, abandoning them, he walked sedately by my side. We strolled on in the cool air, following the course of the stream. The great trees overshadowed us, and the cool green sward stretched away between them at our feet. The boys roamed ahead of me, intent on exploration. Presently I heard a joyful shout, and saw Ernest running at full speed toward me, followed by his brothers. In his hand he held a plant, and, panting for breath, and with sparkling eyes, he held it up to me. "'Potatoes! Potatoes, father!' he gasped out. "'Yes,' said Jack, "'acres and acres of potatoes!' "'My dear Ernest,' said I, for there was no mistaking the flower and leaf, and the light clear green bulbous roots. You have indeed made a discovery. With the potato we shall never starve. But come and look at them, said Jack. Come and feast your eyes on thousands of potatoes. We hurried to the spot. There, spread out before us, was a great tract of ground, covered with the precious plant. It would have been rather difficult, remarked Jack, not to have discovered such a great field. "'Very likely,' replied Ernest, smiling, "'but I doubt if you would have discovered that it was a potato-field.' "'Perhaps not,' said Jack. "'You are quite welcome, at all events, to the honour of the discovery. "'I'll have the honour of being the first to get a supply of them.' So saying, he dug up with hands and knife a number of plants, and filled his game-bag with the roots. The monkey followed his example, and, scratching away with his paws most cleverly, soon had a heap beside him. So delighted were we with the discovery, and so eager were we to possess a large supply of the roots, that we stopped not digging until every bag, pouch, and pocket was filled. Some wished to return at once to Falconhurst, to cook and taste our new acquisition, but this I overruled, and we continued our march heavily laden, but delighted. How, said I, can we thank the giver of all these blessings sufficiently? Oh, said Franz, we can say, We thank thee, O Lord, for all thy goodness and mercy, and bless us for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. That would not be sufficient, said Fritz. Do you think it would be enough just to say to father and mother, Thank you for all you do, 
and not to show them we were really thankful by loving them and doing what we can to please them? "'You are quite right, Fritz,' said I. "'Franz did not say all that was necessary. He should have added, "'Give me grace to do thy will, and to obey thee in all things.' As we thus talked, we reached the head of our streamlet, where it fell from the rocks above in a beautiful, sparkling, splashing cascade. We crossed and entered the tall grass on the other side. We forced our way through with difficulty, so thick and tangled were the reeds. Beyond this the landscape was most lovely. Rich tropical vegetation flourished on every side, the tall, stately palms, surrounded by luxuriant ferns brilliant flowers and graceful creepers, the prickly cactus shooting up amidst them, aloe, jasmine, and sweet-scented vanilla, the Indian pea, and above all the regal pineapple, loaded the breath of the evening breeze with their rich perfume. The boys were delighted with the pineapple, and so eagerly did they fall to that my wife had to caution them that there were no doctors on our territory, and if they became ill— they would have to cure themselves as best they might. This advice, however, seemed to have small effect on my sons, and showing Knips what they wanted, they sent him after the ripest and best fruit. While they were thus employed, I examined the other shrubs and bushes. Among these I presently noticed one which I knew well from the description to be the Karatas. "'Come here, boys,' I said. "'Here is something of far more value than your pineapples.' Do you see that plant with long pointed leaves and beautiful red flower? That is the caratus. The filaments of the leaves make capital thread, while the leaves themselves, bruised, form an invaluable salve. The pith of this wonderful plant may be used either for tinder or bait for fish. Suppose, Ernest, you had been wrecked here, how would you have made a fire without matches or flint and steel? As the savages do, replied he, I would rub two pieces of wood together until they kindled. Try it, I said, but, if you please, try it when you have a whole day before you and no other work to be done, for I am certain it would be night before you accomplish the feat, but see here. And I broke a dry twig from the caratas, and, peeling off the bark, laid the pith upon a stone. I struck a couple of pebbles over it, and, they emitting a spark, the pith caught fire. The boys were delighted with the experiment. I then drew some of the threads from the leaves, and presented them to my wife. "'But what,' said Fritz, "'is the use of all these other prickly plants, except to annoy one? Here, for instance, is a disagreeable little tree.' "'That is an Indian fig,' said I. "'It grows best on dry, rocky ground, for most of its nourishment is derived from the air. Its juice is used, I believe, medicinally, while its fruit is pleasant and wholesome. Master Jack was off in a moment when he heard of a new delicacy, and attempted to gather some of the fruit, but in vain. The sharp thorns defied his efforts, and with bleeding hands and rueful countenance he returned. I removed the thorns from his hands, and, making a sharp wooden skewer, I thrust it into a fig, and quickly twisted it from its branch, and split it open with a knife, still holding it upon the skewer. The rest followed my example, and we regaled ourselves upon the fruit, which we found excellent. Ernest carefully examined the fig he was eating. "'What are these?' he exclaimed presently. "'Little red insects. They cling all over the fruit, and I cannot shake them off. Can they be cochineal?' He handed me the fig, and I examined it attentively. "'You are quite right, my boy,' I said. "'There is no doubt this is the real cochineal. However, though it is worth its weight in gold to European traders, it is of little use to us, I am afraid, unless any of you care to appear in gay colours. The cochineal, you know, forms the most lovely scarlet dye. "'No, thank you,' said Jack, "'but we will take a lot of it when we go home again. Now let us find something more useful to us.' And they thereupon plied me incessantly with questions concerning every plant and shrub we passed." "'Stop, stop!' I said at length. "'The most learned naturalist would be much puzzled with many of these trees, and I, who have never seen any of them before, 
and know them merely by description, cannot pretend to tell you the names or explain to you the use of one quarter of them. Discussing, however, the properties of such shrubs as I did know, we at length reached Tentholm. Everything was safe, and we set to work to collect what we wanted. I opened the butter cask, from which my wife filled her pot. Fritz saw after the ammunition, and Jack and Ernest ran down to the beach to capture the geese and ducks. This they found no easy matter, for the birds, left so long alone, were shy, and nothing would induce them to come on shore and be caught. Ernest at length hit upon an ingenious plan. He took some pieces of cheese, and tied them to long strings. This bait he threw into the water, and the hungry ducks instantly made a grab at it. Then, with a little skilful manoeuvring, he drew them on shore. While Jack and he were thus busily employed catching and tying the rebels together by the feet, we procured a fresh supply of salt, which we packed upon Turk's back, first relieving him of his coat of mail. The birds we fastened to our game-bags, and, carefully closing the door of our tent, started homeward by the seashore. After a cheerful and pleasant walk, we once more reached our woodland abode. I released the birds, and, clipping their wings to prevent their leaving us, established them on the stream. Then, after a delicious supper of potatoes, milk, and butter, we ascended our tree, and turned in. Having remarked a great deal of driftwood on the sands the preceding evening, it occurred to me that it would be well to get some of it, and make a kind of sledge, so that the labour of fetching what we wanted from our stores at Tenth Home might not fall so heavily on ourselves. End of chapter 4, part 1 Read by Kara Schallenberg on July 15, 2009 In San Diego, California